during the break, we were talking, uh, and since there's so many good questions and George's uh, discussion is actually supposed to be a follow on to that, we thought we would more or less continue in this mode. But George, I'm hoping you just give us a couple of minutes, uh, a summary of what you hope to do with life after uh, material or life after capitalism, yeah, rather, and then right. I think we'll continue. Well, we just talked about, uh, we're, and we're talking globally because uh, these Gilder fellows are all around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's exciting to speak to this global audience because there really is only one economy as the supply siders asserted from the beginning. The only real economy is the global economy. And you can't really isolate uh, various portions of the global economy through the system of prices. Uh, uh, everything affects everything else. And so these efforts to sequester particular economies in the name of nationalism or avoiding a virus or whatever the purpose may be are ultimately futile. They can't stop the process of learning that uh, we're describing. Now, we were talking about gold and Isaac Newton's real launch and defense and propagation of the gold standard in the early 19th century through uh, 18th century through the whole world economy. And there was really one money and that money was uh, gold. Every currency could be converted ultimately into gold. And to replace this simple system where money was time and, uh, and this um, measure applied equally across the whole global economy, to replace the system today has taken the world's largest industry. Now, a lot of people might imagine that the largest industry in the world must be food production or transportation or, uh, you know, some uh, construction, housing, shelter. Of, but, but that is wrong. By far, overwhelmingly, the biggest industry in the world economy today is currency trading. This is this vast system of currency trading that replaced that singular gold standard that uh, previously provided a worldwide money. And currency trading today proceeds at somewhere of uh, the Bureau, the, the Bank of International Settlements in uh, Switzerland uh, has a triennial accounting uh, of all the currency trading. And the last accounting was $6.7 trillion every 24 hours, every day, $6.7 trillion uh, a day of currency trading. And, and uh, uh, this was up 30% over three years from 5.1 trillion. And since then, uh, the British in London estimate currency trading. So you can guess that there's been another 20, 30%. It's probably up to around $8 trillion a day, while world trade is in essentially stagnated. Uh, we've had the COVID um, recession where there's a uh, but uh, currency trading goes on in what I call as a hypertrophy of finance. And uh, increasingly, it represents a kind of cancellation of capitalism. And this is what I mean by life after capitalism, that uh, governments, central banks, have uh, captured money and they are manipulating it for their own purposes to uh, award their own cronies, their own political um, associates and targets, and they're, they're uh, stealing t 
time from our our uh, when when governments manipulate money, when central banks manipulate money, they're really uh, manipulating time. They're stealing time from the future, uh, from our children and grandchildren, and and uh, this is the real um, a, a symbol of our general move of um, the various institutional forces in the world economy to take it over from the market um, processes that uh, prevailed to a greater extent in previous eras and allowed this enormous uh, surge of learning uh, that uh, this uh, accumulation of knowledge that we enjoy today and which Gail has uh, recounted uh, so uh, uh, persuasively. And uh, so, uh, so, but uh, the fascinating thing about the study of time prices is it shows you that entrepreneurs all over the world, uh, they uh, kind of ignore all this noise and they uh, f focus on uh, the uh, true facts of the economic world. They focus on, they, they can learn even under uh, conditions which are quite hostile to uh, individual liberty and, and prosperity. So that's the, the life after capitalism. Um, you might imagine uh, with uh, governments all over the world asserting themselves in the name of healthcare uh, with uh, COVID or in the name of climate change. Uh, uh, they're taking over energy markets in the name of climate change. They're taking over healthcare uh, in the name of uh, fighting a virus uh, that is uh, if you really scrutinize the numbers and the history of it is far less uh, menacing than previous viruses that the human race has learned to overcome. And uh, I've recent, I believe that uh, just as economic growth is learning, our immune systems learn. And uh, I'm gonna, in my, in our, COSM conference we're having in November in Seattle. We're having a, a conference uh, devoted to the future of technology in this predicament. I'm going to be uh, uh, debating with Neil Ferguson, the great Stanford historian who's recently written a book of, called Doom, which uh, propounds the idea that globalization air travel, immigration, tourism, intermarriage between different societies and cultures, all these forces uh, make us more vulnerable to pandemics and diseases and, and other disasters. And, and uh, but uh, this whole th thesis, um, is contradicted by the learning that our <clears throat> immune systems have achieved and over the very period that um, these pandemics uh, have occurred, uh, we find our immune systems are becoming more educated more have learned how to deal with new kinds of viral threats and as a result of uh, the spanish flu in 1918 was 50 million people died around the world and and the asian flu in 1957 58 millions of people died more than uh and young people, uh, death rates among young people went up 34% in the United States with the Asian flu of, of 1957 and 58. And by contrast, uh, coronavirus is, a, is really almost a trivial event. 
And so, uh, and as globalization has come, as trade becomes increasingly international, as, as uh, tourism uh, covers the globe and millions of people are in the air moving around the globe, our immune systems, our learning systems, and they become capable of dealing with new threats in the same way that the economy becomes uh, more robust against new threats uh, through the process of learning. And so th this is another uh, kind of uh, episode in learning that uh, Gail was describing the, the Zoom and uh, all the innovations that are emerging from this crisis of uh, global health that we are supposedly under, under, undergoing today. So I, I would just have a question for you, George. Uh, you know, we think about we think about Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and these great uh, innovators, uh, Jeff Bezos. Uh, mm. You know, imagine if they had decided to become currency traders. Yeah, right. You know, I have students that, that come to me, you know, weekly and say, what should I major in? I, I want to make money. Yeah. And, you know, the big kind of uh, money thing today is finance. You should major, major in finance. And what I would just tell you is, yeah, it's important to learn finance, yeah. but, but the talent and the skill and the innovation and creativity that, that you have uh, can, can create much more value outside of that yeah. world of yeah. finance. Yeah. That's what I would just encourage you yeah. to do is, is to think beyond finance into this world where mm -hmm. you, can, you can really create uh, something that's gonna change and, and, and uh, create value for, for every, every yeah. one of us. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is just preposterous that the biggest industry by effect, that, that currency trading is 70 times bigger than all trade and goods and services yeah. around the world. It's just a ludicrous, bizarre a kind of parody of capitalism. You know, we and, looked at, we looked at uh, students, what they were majoring in, in the US and Japan in the 70s. And you suddenly had this shift for U.S. students, they all wanted to be lawyers. Yeah. So they all went into law instead of engineering. Yeah. And Japan continued to, I mean, uh, the U.S. has like a hundred times more lawyers per capita than Japan does. It's, it's and similar like, with China. I mean, China yeah. has uh, thousands of times more engineers now than we do. We're all... Right. So we had all these students that, that were studying engineer and, and they've shifted to finance. Yeah. instead of engineers. So we, we got distracted with, with legal systems and financial systems that are, are important. They're important to a, an economy that this fundamental, you know, how does innovation occur in the world where things are really created, new things that create value, it typically doesn't come from lawyers and finance guys. Yeah, right. And they're using all this talent that you yeah, know in an area yeah. that's, that's not yielding the kind of returns yeah. that we could we could be getting yeah. the the real hmm. innovations as peter Thiel describes them are zero to one there's something completely novel and new yeah and uh there's a lot of innovation that's one to n one to any number which is imitative imitative innovation that proceeds all around the world where an idea in Silicon Valley spreads to Taiwan and to the Middle East and to Africa, you know, that's a globalization of existing ideas. But the real um, pioneers, the real um, creators of new wealth are zero to one in Peter Thiel's time. Peter Thiel is going to be um, keynoting our COSM conference. So that's, a, that's an ex, ex, exciting development. So the, the reason I'm developing this information theory of economics is because of a real limitation of the prevailing economics. The prevailing economics really can't accommodate surprise and we and thus it can't really 
accommodate creativity. Uh, most economic models treat creativity as something exogenous, something outside the system. And it may come from colleges or government laboratories or something in their models, but it's, it's exogenous. And what information theory allows is us to sort out all these issues that we've been discussing today, um, the, you know, the currency trading and the finance and the law and, and all these areas and what their appropriate roles are, government versus enterprise. And, and uh, Claude Shannon, who invented the bit and the bite really defined them, and uh, who uh, invented information theory as we currently know it and apply it through the internet and the computer industry and, and, uh, and uh, defining bandwidth and the capacity of uh, particular channels said that uh, information is essentially unexpected bits. Information is surprise. And uh, this information theory that he developed is the most successful uh, uh, sort of science that's emerged in the 20th century. It was, uh, it, it really is behind the computer industry, the, the internet and all our, cloud computing and all these systems, artificial intelligence, all are have flourished from this information science that, that Shannon introduced in back in 1948 in defining the bit and the byte as and uh, and defining bandwidth and and the so and, and the key point that comes from Shannon's information theory is information is surprise is one thing. And, and uh, the other is that it takes, and, and surprise he defines as entropy. He, he has, if there's a mathematical um, analogy with, with thermodynamic entropy and uh, the Boltzmann, originated. And so he says that information itself is surprise, but uh, it takes a low entropy carrier. That's all the sort of institutional structures, the channels for uh, the bits right, so to, create, to accommodate high entropy, surprising, creative, advances so when i when we're communicating we've got to have a channel or a way that a channel that's clear that doesn't have noise yep. that, that doesn't interfere with our communication that's and then, right uh, if you don't have this clear channel then the information is infected with noise and it degrades the value of that information that right. doesn't doesn't happen so so this idea of being able to have in an economy this channel that's clear of noise, that's free of distortion, that's the institutions and the laws and, and the, the uh, environment that allows entrepreneurs to pursue their creative acts without the noise of, is the currency going to change in value yeah. tomorrow? What's the regulations going to be tomorrow? Yeah, right. you know, I need to have the stability that allows me to pursue this creativity. Right. That's you got to right. have both. You got to have yeah. stability to pursue creativity. Yeah, that's right. So low entropy carriers, high entropy creativity. And, yeah. and uh, when, uh, if, uh, and, and this is uh, uh, the critical principles that, that allow for the first time really to incorporate surprise in uh, economic models. You know, economic models are full of averages. You know, and averages, when you think about it, are really reducing information. They're, right. they're uh, and, uh, and so it, the interest rate uh, gives you the sort of average return 
of uh, an investment across an economy. The profit and loss right. is the entropy, the surprise. So what I think, and it's the profit yeah. and loss that really govern all these uh, amazing advances in time prices and innovation that you were account in, in your time price revolution. I, th I think uh, Gail and Mara and Tupi is uh, Gail's uh, time price revolution is really a fundamental change in economics that uh, is um, well, going to have to be adopted now. You know, this is a great moment uh, where this well, we hope so. <laughs> where this global um, internet faces a terrible crisis of hacking. You know, the internet is a giant copying machine, and it's been hacked hacked constantly the more we spend on security the less security we get we expose the uh, and uh and and world money world money is being hacked by central banks everywhere they're hacking the money so we have the communication system being hacked and the world money being hacked and the remedy is has just emerged uh, the this challenge a hacking challenge facing our communications and uh, monetary systems has uh, generated creativity and unexpected development of what I call the cryptocosm uh, uh, and the side of Shannon's information theory. He began with cryptography during the Second World War and wrote a, a paper on cryptography, which is the, really the science of noise. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and now we're integrating cryptography with our global networks and our global um, money and uh, the cryptocosm and the blockchain which uh, creates a low entropy ground state for uh, creativity in the future. So I think the emergence of the blockchain, um, uh, it's embodied in Bitcoin, which is a flawed solution for money, but uh, a step forward and, but thousands of new cryptocurrencies have emerged and, and they're all working out. And I think they're all, ultimately gravitating toward a recognition that time prices are the true prices. And that uh, as uh, a cryptocurrency arises that uh, incorporates the truth that uh, money is ultimately time, yeah. where tokenized time, it's, uh, it's well, how you have to yeah. the coins are kind of tokens of time that you can uh, use to um, overcome the, the uh, obstacles of barter across an economy. Right. And, and you can have fungible uh, transactions across the world through tokenized time. So the, the, the fundamental values really that we see in economics is this ability to trust one another. Yep. And we've got to have systems in place that allow us to trust more and more people. The reason yep. that we've been able to, to escape poverty is be, we've been able to expand our trust uh, scope to, to yep. more and more people. Yep. And we, we, being able to trust a stranger yep. uh, has really yielded this phenomenal uh, result in, in wealth and value creation for both parties. Yep. And so, so as we move forward, uh, learning and trusting, yep. both of those things, policy should be looking at what is this policy going to do to encourage learning? Mm -hmm. Is this policy going to prevent learning from happening? That's yep. the problem with COVID right now. You can, you can talk about whatever... Uh, you want to, but have we have we limited learning yeah. with the policy? Yeah. And some would argue, yeah, we're limiting learning because we're not trying these different alternatives. And then the other element is trust. How do we establish trust with one another? And yeah. ultimately, an economy is based on trust. Yeah. And and trust is this idea that we've got to have this channel that's free of noise that both of us can agree on 
that we're going to trust this thing. Mm -hmm. And then we can trade. Mm -hmm. We can't trade until we can trust. Mm -hmm. Good insight. You, sure. uh, we should move to questions. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, and so we hopefully have a time for a couple of questions, but George had mentioned something about uh, time price theory. So, uh, Gail, I'd like you to just answer this one question okay. um, from Manoj Ranshore. So for time price theory, will you and uh, Tupi maybe write an academic paper with the hypothesis to get the concept in the literature? And, and are you optimistic that the concept of time prices will be recognized and accepted by the economics profession. I mean, I know some of the core of it is, but what, what do you think uh, about getting this concept sort of broadly accepted or at least discussed? Yeah, time prices were actually, Adam Smith talked about time prices, yeah. uh, believe it or not, in, in his uh, book in 1776. He essentially said, we buy things with money, but we pay for them with our time. He used mm -hmm. uh, you know, some Scottish old English words, but that's <laughs> the essence of what he said. So time prices have been around uh, a long time. Uh, William Nordhaus talked about them. Uh, <clears throat> there have been other economists, uh, Julian Simon, one of the, one of the economists mm -hmm. that, that we, we write about a lot, he talked about time prices. So our hope is, is we have written these papers and published them, and our hope is that, that uh, more and more economists will come to, to uh, incorporate um, this thinking in, in their uh, economics textbooks. Is your web page, you have, uh, our, our readers can go to your web, web page, right? You can go to human, uh, humanprogress.org, and that's mm -hmm. uh, a website that's sponsored by the Cato Institute. My, uh, my colleague, Mary Tupi, runs that. And if you go to that site and look up the Simon Abundance Index, that will lay out all of the academic work and the equations that we use to develop the, the theoretical or the conceptual framework. And what we, what we did is we developed this conceptual framework about how to measure abundance. And then we use this toolkit or this framework to look at all of this uh, different pricing data. So initially we went back and looked at these 50 commodities uh, back to 1980. Uh, we're working on a book right now uh, that uh, goes back clear to 1850 and looks at things. We look at uh, all kinds of different products, uh, you know, from bicycles to the price of sugar. Uh, real quick on sugar, uh, the, the time it took you to earn the money to buy one pound of sugar in 1850, how many pounds of sugar do you think you could get today? 227 pounds. All right. So <laughs> life has become 227 Not that that's a good, a good thing. I guess and and yeah, population the time price has dropped from... <laughs> during this period, right? Population was went from a billion people to almost 8 billion people. So what, what... the more population, the more, which I'm going to explain tomorrow, the more population, the more uh, more creativity right. and, so... and the more abundance. And the mistake that Thanos made, and if Thanos had read our mm -hmm. paper, if he had, if he had, if he had read George's work, he would have realized that he was his his framework was incorrect. That he shouldn't be counting things. He shouldn't be counting atoms. Mm -hmm. He should be thinking of the value that's created instead of looking at the piano and counting eighty eight keys. He should have been listening to the music that you can create. Yeah, right. this, this infinite <laughs> music that that you can create with just uh, this this kind of physical limited resources. So we move from counting to looking at prices to looking at time prices, and then looking at the change in time prices over time. Mm -hmm. That and, framework is mm -hmm. and go from zero sum games, where a gain for one person is necessarily a loss for someone else, which right. is zero sum economics is like. Marxian economics is essentially zero sum economics. And to. Um, yeah, if you believe to, that we have a fixed number of resources on the planet and then we just have to divide those up, we had another person, everybody's slice is going to get smaller. But the reality is, is human beings innovate, they make the pizza bigger. Mm -hmm. More people come, they actually make this pizza bigger. So not only do, do individual slices, get larger but we have more people so the, the more total pizzas, global so. pie is getting larger much faster than our population is increasing yeah 
Yep. And with all the sugar and pizza, we're also getting a lot bigger. <laughs> so there's always trade-offs on these things, yeah. I suppose. Well, I want you guys to tackle this one question because it connects actually um, the stuff you're talking about with time prices with George's work in life after Google. So let me just read the question from Dave Kruger. She says, currently the value chain of digitized personal information uh, is controlled by relatively few corporations, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. If individuals were able to control and therefore monetize the use of their own personal digitized information, what would be the impact to innovation and the time price of digitized personal information? That's a dense question. So if we were able to somehow privatize this information that's right now held by these few companies, would this have, um, this is a toughie, but I think it's a very interesting question. Well, in uh, Life After Google, I discussed this issue and uh, Brendan Ike is one of the great figures in the history of Silicon Valley. He was a, he, a founder of Netscape, a founder of Mozilla, of, uh, creator of JavaScript, which is the most prevalent uh, computer language at various times across the internet. And uh, now he's invented the Brave browser that uh, the goal of which is to give individuals more control over their own uh, data. I'm, I'm, uh, I think that uh, the dominance of Google, Facebook, Twitter at all is uh, overrated, that uh, these, these companies are um, reminiscent of IBM and Microsoft at previous eras that uh, when uh, they were considered to be utterly dominant. I mean, uh, the idea that a Google and a Facebook could emerge in the face of the supposed complete control of the internet by um, yeah. my, Microsoft yeah. or Yahoo before that um, was uh, seemed uh, very dim. So I, I think that uh, as I explained in Life After Google, where, where uh, Google has a flawed economic model of, uh, of being overwhelmingly dependent on advertising and, uh, and they, they call them ads, but in fact, we know they're minuses. We, most of the time, we don't want the ads. They, they don't contribute. And, and so, so I, I think that, that, uh, that this era will, provided we allow uh, new companies to rise up and challenge them. As one came by Discovery Institute yesterday, uh, an amazing uh, company uh, that is uh, contriving a new search engine and content generating capability that can, uh, uh, displace both Google and Wikipedia that it uh, and at the same time allow each individual to control his own search and his own content and right. and so of course blockchain yeah. is all devoted to uh, to providing individuals with control over their own identities and own uh, data so I think I think this problem that people are talking about are, is being solved by new technologies and by new entrepreneurial creations. And the big threat to it, frankly, is these uh, politicians who think they can regulate these com companies and, and, uh, and turn them essentially into government entities. And the one thing that uh, closest to eternal life is a government bureaucracy. And, and really, uh, the politicians who want to regulate Facebook and, and Amazon and Google and all these great companies are, are, uh, are likely to destroy them in the process without opening the way for uh, alternative creations, which are not predictable today. They're, right. they're going to be a surprise, like that company, his name was uh, Philip Parker came by yesterday and uh, and 
and um, launch this really uh, entirely new technology that uh, at least theoretically uh, can uh, replace Google. And yeah, so, so, so yeah. There are, these are surprises and there and information theory says information is surprise so here's here's would be my take on it look there's always going to be the biggest company in an industry i mean yep. there's always going to be the, the number one company the issue is is does that company have the power to prevent other companies from competing with them and and the way that other companies compete with them is by learning faster so what we see is when those companies go to government and use government to limit other companies from entering the market and bringing their learning to the table, that's where the problem arises. So government regulation really is a form of preventing new learning from occurring. And that's the danger. That's where we end up with the status quo. Yeah. Yeah. 